Chapter Four, Part Three of the Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty: Its Cause and Consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty by Sir John Barrow Chapter 4, Part 3 The Open Boat Navigation On another occasion, when a stew of oysters was distributed among the people, Lieutenant Bly observes, in the manuscript journal, in the distribution of it, the voraciousness of some and the moderation of others were very discernible. The master began to be dissatisfied the first, because it was not made into a larger quantity by the addition of water, and showed a turbulent disposition, until I laid my commands on him to be silent. Again, on his refusing bread to the men, because they were collecting oysters, he says, this occasioned some murmuring with the master and carpenter, the former of whom endeavoured to prove the propriety of such an expenditure, and was troublesomely ignorant, tending to create disorder among those, if any were weak enough to listen to him. If what Bly states with regard to the conduct of the master and the carpenter be true, it was such, on several occasions, as to provoke a man much less irritable than himself. He thus speaks of the latter, when in the ship and in the midst of the mutiny. The boatswain and carpenter were fully at liberty. The former was employed, on pain of death, to hoist the boats out, but the latter I saw acting the part of an idler, with an impudent and ill-looking countenance, which led me to believe he was one of the mutineers, until he was among the rest ordered to leave the ship, for it appeared to me to be a doubt with Christian at first, whether he should keep the carpenter or his mate, Norman, but knowing the former to be a troublesome fellow, he determined on the latter. The following paragraph also appears in his original journal, on the day of the mutiny, but is not alluded to in his printed narrative. The master's cabin was opposite to mine. He saw them, the mutineers, in my cabin, for our eyes met each other through his door window. He had a pair of ship's pistols loaded, and ammunition in his cabin. A firm resolution might have made a good use of them. After he had sent twice or thrice to Christian to be allowed to come on deck, he was at last permitted, and his question then was, Will you let me remain in the ship? No. Have you any objection, Captain Bly? I whispered to him to knock him down. Martin is good. This is the man who gave the shaddock for this was just before Martin was removed from me. Christian, however, pulled me back and sent away the master, with orders to go again to his cabin, and I saw no more of him until he was put into the boat. He afterwards told me that he could find nobody to act with him, that by staying in the ship he hoped to have retaken her, and that, as to the pistols, he was so flurried and surprised that he did not recollect he had them. This master tells a very different story respecting the pistols in his evidence before the court-martial. Whatever, therefore, on the whole, may have been the conduct of Bligh towards his officers, that of some of the latter appears to have been on several occasions provoking enough, and well calculated to stir up the irascible temper of a man, active and zealous in the extreme, as Bligh always was, in the execution of his duty. Some excuse may be found for hasty expressions uttered in a moment of irritation, when passion gets the better of reason, but no excuse can be found for one who deeply and unfeelingly, without provocation, and in cold blood, inflicts a wound on the heart of a widowed mother, already torn with anguish and tortured with suspense for a beloved son, whose life was in imminent jeopardy. Such a man was William Bly. This charge is not loosely asserted. It is founded on documentary evidence under his own hand. Since the death of the late Captain Hayward, some papers have been brought to light that throw a still more unfavourable stigma 
on the character of the two commanders, Bly and Edwards, than any censure that has hitherto appeared in print, though the conduct of neither of them has been spared whenever an occasion has presented itself for bringing their names before the public. Bly, it may be recollected, mentions young Hayward only as one of those left in the ship. He does not charge him with taking any active part in the mutiny. There is every reason, indeed, to believe that Bly did not, and indeed could not, see him on deck on that occasion. In point of fact, he never was within thirty feet of Captain Bly, and the booms were between them. About the end of March, 1790, two months subsequent to the death of a most beloved and lamented husband, Mrs. Hayward received the afflicting information, but by report only, of a mutiny having taken place on board the Bounty. In that ship Mrs. Hayward's son had been serving as a midshipman, who, when he left his home in August 1787, was under fifteen years of age, a boy deservedly admired and beloved by all who knew him, and, to his own family, almost an object of adoration, for his superior understanding and the amiable qualities of his disposition. In a state of mind little short of distraction, on hearing this fatal intelligence, which was at the same time aggravated by every circumstance of guilt that calumny or malice could invent with respect to this unfortunate youth, who was said to be one of the ringleaders, and to have gone armed into the captain's cabin. His mother addressed a letter to Captain Bly, dictated by a mother's tenderness, and strongly expressive of the misery she must necessarily feel on such an occasion. The following is Bly's reply. London, April 2nd, 1790. Madam, I received your letter this day, and feel for you very much being perfectly sensible of the extreme distress you must suffer from the conduct of your son Peter. His baseness is beyond all description, but I hope you will endeavour to prevent the loss of him, heavy as the misfortune is, from afflicting you too severely. I imagine he is, with the rest of the mutineers, returned to Otaheite. I am, madam, signed, William Bligh. Colonel Holwell, the uncle of young Hayward, had previously addressed Bly on the same melancholy subject, to whom he returned the following answer. 26th of March, 1790. Sir, I have just this instant received your letter. With much concern I inform you that your nephew, Peter Hayward, is among the mutineers. His ingratitude to me is of the blackest dye, for I was a father to him in every respect, and he never once had an angry word from me through the whole course of the voyage, as his conduct always gave me much pleasure and satisfaction. I very much regret that so much baseness formed the character of a young man I had real regard for, and it will give me much pleasure to hear that his friends can bear the loss of him without much concern. I am, sir, etc. Signed, William Bly. The only way of accounting for this ferocity of sentiment towards a youth, who had in point of fact no concern in the mutiny, is by a reference to certain points of evidence given by Hayward, Hallett, and Purcell on the court-martial, each point wholly unsupported. Those in the boat would no doubt, during their long passage, often discuss the conduct of their messmates left in the bounty, and the unsupported evidence given by these three was well calculated to create in Bly's mind a prejudice against young Hayward. Yet, if so, it affords but a poor excuse for harrowing up the feelings of near and dear relatives. As a contrast to these ungracious letters, it is a great relief to peruse the correspondence that took place on this melancholy occasion between this unfortunate young officer and his amiable but dreadfully afflicted family. The letters of his sister, Nessie Hayward, of which a few will be inserted in the course of this narrative, exhibit so lively and ardent an affection for her beloved brother are couched in so high a tone of feeling for his honour and confidence in his innocence, and are so nobly answered by the suffering youth, that no apology seems to be required for their introduction, more especially as their contents are strictly connected with the story of the ill-fated crew of the bounty. 
after a state of long suspense this amiable and accomplished young lady thus addresses her brother isle of man second of june seventeen ninety two in a situation of mind only rendered supportable by the long and painful state of misery and suspense we have suffered on his account how shall i address my dear my fondly beloved brother how describe the anguish we have felt at the idea of this long and painful separation rendered still more distressing by the terrible circumstances attending it oh my ever dearest boy when i look back to that dreadful moment which brought us the fatal intelligence that you had remained in the bounty after mr bly had quitted her and were looked upon by him as a mutineer when i contrast that day of horror with my present hopes of again beholding you such as my most sanguine wishes could expect i know not which is the most predominant sensation pity compassion and terror for your sufferings or joy and satisfaction at the prospect of their being near a termination and of once more embracing the dearest object of our affections i will not ask you my beloved brother whether you are innocent of the dreadful crime of mutiny if the transactions of that day were as mr bligh has represented them such is my conviction of your worth and honour that i will without hesitation stake my life on your innocence if on the contrary you were concerned in such a conspiracy against your commander i shall be as firmly persuaded his conduct was the occasion of it but alas could any occasion justify so atrocious an attempt to destroy a number of our fellow-creatures no my ever dearest brother nothing but conviction from your own mouth can possibly persuade me that you would commit an action in the smallest degree inconsistent with honour and duty and the circumstance of your having swam off to the pandora on her arrival at otaheite which filled us with joy to which no words can do justice is sufficient to convince all who know you that you certainly stayed behind either by force or from views of preservation how strange does it seem to me that i am now engaged in the delightful task of writing to you alas my beloved brother two years ago i never expected again to enjoy such a felicity and even yet i am in the most painful uncertainty whether you are alive gracious god grant that we may be at length blessed by your return but alas the pandora's people have been long expected and are not even yet arrived should any accident have happened after all the miseries you have already suffered the poor gleam of hope with which we have been lately indulged will render our situation ten thousand times more insupportable than if time had inured us to your loss I send this to the care of Mr. Hayward of Hackney, father to the young gentleman you so often mention in your letters while you were on board the Bounty, and who went out as third lieutenant of the Pandora, a circumstance which gave us infinite satisfaction, as you would, on entering the Pandora, meet your old friend. On discovering old Mr. Hayward's residence, I wrote to him, as I hoped he could give me some information respecting the time of your arrival and in return he sent me a most friendly letter, and has promised this shall be given to you when you reach England, as I well know how great must be your anxiety to hear of us, and how much satisfaction it will give you to have a letter immediately on your return. Let me conjure you, my dearest Peter, to write to us the very first moment. Do not lose a post. Tis of no consequence how short your letter may be, if it only informs us you are well. I need not tell you that you are the first and dearest object of our affections. Think then, my adored boy, of the anxiety we must feel on your account. For my own part I can know no real joy or happiness independent of you, and if any misfortune should now deprive us of you, my hopes of felicity are fled for ever. We are at present making all possible interest with every friend and connection we have to ensure you a sufficient support and protection at your approaching trial, for a trial you must unavoidably undergo, in order to convince the world of that innocence which those who know you will not for a moment doubt. But alas, while circumstances are against you, 
the generality of mankind will judge severely. Bly's representations to the Admiralty are, I am told, very unfavourable, and hitherto the tide of public opinion has been greatly in his favour. My mamma is at present well, considering the distress she has suffered since you left us. For, my dearest brother, we have experienced a complicated scene of misery from a variety of causes, which, however, when compared with the sorrow we felt on your account, was trifling and insignificant. That misfortune made all others light, and to see you once more returned and safely restored to us will be the summit of all earthly happiness. Farewell, my most beloved brother. God grant this may soon be put into your hands. Perhaps at this moment you are arrived in England, and I may soon have the dear delight of again beholding you. My mamma, brothers and sisters, join with me in every sentiment of love and tenderness. Write to us immediately, my ever-loved Peter, and may the Almighty preserve you until you bless with your presence your fondly affectionate family, and particularly your unalterably faithful friend and sister. Nessie Haywood. The gleam of joy which this unhappy family derived from the circumstance which had been related to them of young Haywood's swimming off to the Pandora was dissipated by a letter from himself to his mother soon after his arrival in England, in which he says, The question, my dear mother, in one of your letters concerning my swimming off to the Pandora is one falsity among the too many in which I have often thought of undeceiving you, and as frequently forgot. The story was this. On the morning she arrived, accompanied by two of my friends, natives, I was going up the mountains, and having got about a hundred yards from my own house, another of my friends, for I was a universal favourite among those Indians, and perfectly conversant in their language, came running after me, and informed me there was a ship coming, I immediately ascended a rising ground, and saw, with indescribable joy, a ship laying to off Happiano. It was just after daylight, and thinking Coleman might not be awake, and therefore ignorant of this pleasing news, I sent one of my servants to inform him of it, upon which he immediately went off in a single canoe. There was a fresh breeze, and the ship working into the bay. He no sooner got alongside than the rippling capsized the canoe, and he, being obliged to let go the tow-rope to get her righted, went astern, and was picked up the next tack, and taken on board the Pandora, he being the first person. I, along with my messmate Stuart, was then standing upon the beach with a double canoe, manned with twelve paddles, ready for launching, and just as she made her last tack into her berth, for we did not think it requisite to go off sooner, we put off and got alongside just as they streamed the boy, and being dressed in the country manner, tanned as brown as themselves, and I tattooed like them in the most curious manner, I do not in the least wonder at their taking us for natives. I was tattooed not to gratify my own desire, but theirs, for it was my constant endeavour to acquiesce in any little custom which I thought would be agreeable to them, though painful in the process, provided I gained by it their friendship and esteem, which you may suppose is no inconsiderable object in an island where the natives are so numerous. The more a man or woman there is tattooed, the more they are respected, and a person having none of these marks is looked upon as bearing an unworthy badge of disgrace, and considered as a mere outcast of society. Among the many anxious friends and family connections of the Haywards was Commodore Paisley, to whom this affectionate young lady addressed herself on the melancholy occasion, and the following is the reply she received from this officer. She and S., June the 8th, 1792. Would to God, my dearest Nessie, that I could rejoice with you on the early prospect of your brother's arrival in England. One division of the Pandora's people has arrived, and now on board the Vengeance, my ship, Captain Edwards, with the remainder, and all the prisoners late of the bounty, in number ten, four having been drowned on the loss of that ship, are daily expected. 
They have been most rigorously and closely confined since taken, and will continue so, no doubt, till Bly's arrival. You have no chance of seeing him, for no bail can be offered. Your intelligence of his swimming off on the Pandora's arrival is not founded. A man of the name of Coleman swam off ere she anchored, your brother and Mr. Stewart the next day. This last youth, when the Pandora was lost, refused to allow his irons to be taken off to save his life. I cannot conceal it from you, my dearest Nessie, neither is it proper I should. Your brother appears, by all accounts, to be the greatest culprit of all, Christian alone excepted. Every exertion you may rest assured I shall use to save his life, but on trial I have no hope of his not being condemned. Three of the ten who are expected are mentioned in Bly's narrative, as men detained against their inclination. Would to God your brother had been one of that number! I will not distress you more by enlarging on this subject. As intelligence arises on their arrival, you shall be made acquainted. Adieu, my dearest Nessie! Present my affectionate remembrances to your mother and sisters, and believe me always, with the warmest affection, your uncle, Thomas Paisley. How unlike is this from the letter of Bly, while it frankly apprises this amiable lady of the real truth of the case, without disguise, as it was then understood to be from Mr. Bly's representations, it assures her of his best exertions to save her brother's life. Every reader of sensibility will sympathise in the feeling displayed in her reply. Isle of Man, 22nd of June, 1792 Harassed by the most torturing suspense, and miserably wretched as I have been, my dearest uncle, since the receipt of your last, conceive, if it is possible, the heartfelt joy and satisfaction we experienced yesterday morning, when, on the arrival of the packet, the dear delightful letter from our beloved Peter, a copy of which I send you enclosed, was brought to us. Surely, my excellent friend, you will agree with me in thinking there could not be a stronger proof of his innocence and worth, and that it must prejudice every person who reads it most powerfully in his favour. Such a letter, in less distressful circumstances than those in which he writes, would, I am persuaded, reflect honour on the pen of a person much older than my poor brother. But when we consider his extreme youth, only sixteen at the time of the mutiny, and now but nineteen. His fortitude, patience, and manly resignation under the pressure of sufferings and misfortunes almost unheard of, and scarcely to be supported at any age, without the assistance of that which seems to be my dear brother's greatest comfort, a quiet conscience, and a thorough conviction of his own innocence, when I add, at the same time, with real pleasure and satisfaction, that his relation corresponds in many particulars with the accounts we have hitherto heard of the fatal mutiny, and when I also add, with inconceivable pride and delight, that my beloved Peter never was known to breathe a syllable inconsistent with truth and honour, when these circumstances, my dear uncle, are all united, what man on earth can doubt of the innocence which could dictate such a letter? In short, let it speak for him. The perusal of his artless and pathetic story will, I am persuaded, be a stronger recommendation in his favour than anything I can urge. I need not tire your patience, my ever-loved uncle, by dwelling longer on this subject the dearest and most interesting on earth to my heart. Let me conjure you only, my kind friend, to read it, and consider the innocence and defenceless situation of its unfortunate author, which calls for, and I am sure deserves, all the pity and assistance his friends can afford him, and which, I am sure also, the goodness and benevolence of your heart will prompt you to exert in his behalf. It is perfectly unnecessary for me to add, after the anxiety I feel, and cannot but express, that no benefit conferred upon myself will be acknowledged with half the gratitude I must ever feel for the smallest instance of kindness shown to my beloved Peter. Farewell, my dearest uncle. 
with the firmest reliance on your kind and generous promises, I am, ever with the truest gratitude and sincerity, your most affectionate niece, Nessie Hayward. End of chapter 4, part 3The Pandora, Part 1, of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty, its cause and consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Haley Flagg. The eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty, by Sir John Barrow. Chapter 5, Part 1. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. A brave vessel who had no doubt some noble creatures in her dashed all to pieces. Oh, the cry did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth, or ere it should the good ship so have swallowed, and the freighting souls within her. The tide of public applause set as strongly in favor of Bly, on account of his sufferings and the successful issue of his daring enterprise, as its indignation was launched against Christian and his associates for the audacious and criminal deed they had committed. Bly was promoted by the Admiralty to the rank of commander, and speedily sent out a second time to transport the breadfruit to the West Indies, which he, without the least obstruction, successfully accomplished and his majesty's government were no sooner made acquainted with the atrocious act of piracy and mutiny than it determined to adopt every possible means to apprehend and bring to condign punishment the perpetrators of so foul a deed for this purpose the pandora frigate of twenty-four guns and one hundred and sixty men was dispatched under the command of captain edward edwards with orders to proceed in the first instance to otaheite and not finding the mutineers there to visit the different groups of the Society and Friendly Islands, and others in the neighboring parts of the Pacific, using his best endeavors to seize and bring home in confinement the whole or such part of the delinquents as he might be able to discover. This voyage was in the sequel almost as disastrous as that of the bounty, but from a different cause. The waste of human life was much greater, occasioned by the wreck of the ship, and the distress experienced by the crew not much less, owing to the famine and thirst they had to suffer in a navigation of eleven hundred miles in open boats. But the captain succeeded in fulfilling a part of his instructions by taking fourteen of the mutineers, of whom ten were brought safe to England, the other four being drowned when the ship was wrecked. The only published account of this voyage is contained in a small volume by Mr. George Hamilton, the surgeon, who appears to have been a coarse, vulgar, and illiterate man, more disposed to relate licentious scenes and adventures in which he and his companions were engaged than to give any information of proceedings and occurrences connected with the main object of the voyage. From this book, therefore, much information is not to be looked for. In a more modern publication, many abusive epithets have been bestowed on Captain Edwards, and observations made on the conduct of this officer highly injurious to his reputation in regards to his inhuman treatment of and disgraceful acts of cruelty towards his prisoners which it is to be feared have but too much foundation in fact the account of his proceedings rendered by himself to the admiralty is vague and unsatisfactory and had it not been for the journal of morrison and a circumstantial letter of young haywood to his mother no record would have remained of the unfeeling conduct of this officer towards his unfortunate prisoners, who were treated with a rigor which could not be justified on any ground of necessity or prudence. The Pandora anchored on Madai Bay on the 23rd March, 1791. Captain Edwards, in his narrative, states that Joseph Coleman, the armorer of the bounty, attempted to come on board before the Pandora had anchored, that on reaching the ship he began to make inquiries of him after the bounty and her people, and that he seemed to be ready to give him any information that was required, that the next who came on board just after the ship had anchored were Mr. Peter Haywood and Mr. Stewart before any boat had been sent on shore, that they were brought down to his cabin when, after some conversation, Haywood asked if Mr. Hayward, midshipman of the Bounty but now lieutenant of the Pandora, was on board, as he had heard that he was. That lieutenant Hayward, whom he sent for, 
treated Haywood with a sort of contemptuous look, and began to enter into conversation with him respecting the bounty. But Edwards ordered him to desist, and called in the sentinel to take the prisoners into safe custody, and put them in irons, that four other mutineers soon made their appearance, and that, from them and some of the natives, he learned that the rest of the bounty's people had built a schooner, with which they had sailed the day before, from Matayai Bay to the northwest part of the island. He goes on to say that, on this intelligence, he dispatched the two lieutenants, Corner and Hayward, with the pinnace and launch, to endeavor to intercept her. They soon got sight of her and chased her out to sea, but the schooner gained so much upon them, and night coming on, they were compelled to give up the pursuit and return to the ship. It was soon made known, however, that she had returned to Papare, on which they were again dispatched in search of her. Lieutenant Corner had taken three of the mutineers, and Hayward, on arriving at Papare, found the schooner there, but the mutineers had abandoned her and fled to the mountains. He carried off the schooner and returned next day when he learned they were not far off, and the following morning, on hearing they were coming down, he drew up his party in order to receive them, and when within hearing called to them to lay down their arms and to go on one side, which they did, when they were confined and brought as prisoners to the ship. The following were the persons received on board the Pandora. Peter Haywood, midshipman. George Stewart, midshipman. James Morrison, boatswain's mate. Charles Norman, carpenter's mate. Thomas McIntosh, carpenter's crew. Joseph Coleman, armorer. Richard Skinner, Thomas Ellison. Henry Hillbrandt, Thomas Burkett. John Millward, John Sumner. William Muspratt, Michael Byrne, all seamen. In all, fourteen. The other two, which made up the sixteen that had been left on the island, were murdered, as will appear presently. Captain Edwards will himself explain how he disposed of his prisoners. I put the pirates, he says, into a round house which I built on the after part of the quarter deck, for their more effectual security in this airy and healthy situation, and to separate them from, and to prevent their having communication with, or to crowd and incommode, the ship's company. Dr. Hamilton calls it the most desirable place in the ship, and adds that orders were given that the prisoners should be victualled in every respect, the same as the ship's company, both in meat, liquor, and all the extra indulgences with which they were so liberally supplied, notwithstanding the established laws of the service, which restrict prisoners to two-thirds allowance. But Captain Edwards very humanely commiserated their unhappy and inevitable length of confinement. Mr. Morrison, one of the prisoners, gives a very different account of their treatment from that of Edwards or Hamilton. He says that Captain Edwards put both legs of the two midshipmen in irons, and that he branded them with the appropriate epithet of piratical villains, that they, with the rest, being strongly handcuffed, were put into a kind of roundhouse, only eleven feet long, built as a prison, and aptly named Pandora's Box, which was entered by a scuttle in the roof, about eighteen inches square. This was done in order that they might be kept separate from the crew, and also the more effectually to prevent them from having any communication with the natives, that such of those friendly creatures as ventured to look pitifully towards them were instantly turned out of the ship, and never again allowed to come on board. But two sentinels were kept constantly upon the roof of the prison with orders to shoot the first of its inmates who should attempt to address another in the Otaheitean dialect. That Captain Edwards took every precaution to keep his prisoners in safe custody, and placed them in confinement, as by his instructions he was directed to do, may be well imagined. End note 14. But Mr. Morrison will probably be thought to go somewhat beyond credibility in stating that orders were given to shoot any of the prisoners when confined in irons. Captain Edwards must have known that such an act would have cost him his commission or something more. The fact is, that information was given to Edwards, at least he so asserts, that the brother of the king of Otaheite, an intelligent chief, that a conspiracy was formed among the natives to cut the ship's cables the first strong wind that should blow on the shore, which was considered to be the more probable, as many of the prisoners were said to be married to the most respectable chief's daughters in the district opposite to the anchorage that the midshipman Stuart, in particular, had married the daughter of a man of great landed property near Matai Bay. This intelligence, no doubt, weighed with the captain in giving his orders for the close confinement of the prisoners, and particularly in restricting the visits of the natives. 
but so far is it from being true that all communication between the mutineers and the natives was cut off that we are distinctly told by mr hamilton that the prisoners wives visited the ship daily and brought their children who were permitted to be carried to their unhappy fathers to see the poor captives in irons he says weeping over their tender offspring was too moving a scene for any feeling heart their wives brought them ample supplies of every delicacy that the country afforded, while we lay there and behaved with the greatest fidelity and affection to them. End note 15. Of the fidelity and attachment of these simple-minded creatures, an instant is afforded of the affecting story which is told in the first missionary voyage of the Duff, of the unfortunate wife of the reputed mutineer, Mr. Stewart. It would seem also to exonerate Edwards from some part of the charges which have been brought against him. The history of Peggy Stewart marks a tenderness of heart that never will be heard without emotion. She was the daughter of a chief, and taken for his wife by Mr. Stewart, one of the unhappy mutineers. They had lived with the old chief in the most tender state of endearment. A beautiful little girl had been the fruit of their union and was, at the breast when the Pandora arrived, seized the criminals, and secured them in irons on board the ship. Frantic with grief, the unhappy Peggy, for so he had named her, flew with her infant in a canoe to the arms of her husband. The interview was so affecting and afflicting that the officers on board were overwhelmed with anguish, and Stuart himself, unable to bear the heart-rending scene, begged she might not be admitted again on board. She was separated from him by violence, and conveyed on shore in a state of despair and grief too big for utterance. Withheld from him, and forbidden to come any more on board, she sunk into the deepest dejection. It preyed on her vitals. She lost all relish for food and life, rejoiced no more, pined under a rapid decay of two months, and fell a victim to her feelings, dying literally of a broken heart. Her child is yet alive, and a tender object of our care, having been brought up by a sister, who nursed it as her own, and has discharged all the duties of an affectionate mother to the orphan infant. End note 16. It does not appear that young Haywood formed any matrimonial engagement during his abode in Otaheite. He was not, however, insensible to the amiable and good qualities of these people. In some laudatory verses which he wrote while on the island, their numerous good qualities are spoken of in terms of the highest commendation. All the mutineers that were left on the island being received on board the Pandora, that ship proceeded in search of those who had gone away in the bounty. It may be mentioned, however, that two of the most active in the mutiny, Churchill and Thompson, had perished on the island before her arrival by violent deaths. These two men had accompanied a chief, who was the Tayo, or sworn friend of Churchill, and having died without children, this mutineer succeeded to his property and dignity, according to the custom of the country. Thompson, for some real or fancied insult, took an opportunity of shooting his companion. The natives assembled and came to a resolution to avenge the murder, and literally stoned Thompson to death, and his skull was brought on board the Pandora. This horrible wretch had some time before slain a man and a child through mere wantonness, but escaped punishment by a mistake that had nearly proved fatal to young Haywood. It seems that the description of a person in Otaheite is usually given by some distinguishing figure of the tattoo, and Haywood, having the same mark as Thompson, was taken for him and just as the club was raised to dash out his brains, the interposition of the old chief, with whom he was travelling round the island, was just in time to avert the blow. Captain Edwards had no clue to guide him as to the route taken by the bounty, but he learnt from different people and from journals kept on board that ship, which were found in the chests of the mutineers at Otaheite, the proceedings of Christian and his associates after Lieutenant Bly and his companions had been turned adrift in the launch. From these it appears that the pirates proceeded in the first instance to the island of Tubuai, in latitudes 20 degrees 13 minutes south, longitude 149 degrees 35 minutes west, where they anchored on the 25th of May, 1789. They had thrown overboard the greater part of the breadfruit plants, and divided among themselves the property of the officers and men who had been so inhumanely turned adrift. At this island they intended to form a settlement, but the opposition of the natives, the want of many necessary materials and quarrels among themselves determined them to go to Otaheite to procure what might be required to effect their purpose, provided they should agree to prosecute their original intention. They accordingly sailed from Tubuai about the latter end of the month, and arrived at Otaheite on the 6th of June. 
the otu or reigning sovereign and other principal natives were very inquisitive and anxious to know what had become of lieutenant bligh and the rest of the crew and also what had been done with the breadfruit plants they were told they had most unexpectedly fallen in with captain cook at an island he had just discovered called waitutaki where he intended to form a settlement and where the plants had been landed and that lieutenant bligh and the others were stopping there to assist captain cook in the business he had in hand and that he had appointed Mr. Christian commander of the bounty, and that he was now come by his orders for an additional supply of hogs, goats, fowls, breadfruit, and various other articles which Otaheite could supply. This artful story was quite sufficient to impose on the credulity of the humane and simple-minded islanders, and so overcome with joy were they to hear that their old friend Captain Cook was alive and about to settle so near them, that every possible means were forthwith made use of to procure the things that were wanted, so that in the course of a few days the bounty received on board three hundred and twelve hogs, thirty-eight goats, eight dozen of fowls, a bull and a cow, and a large quantity of breadfruit, plantains, bananas, and other fruits. They also took with them eight men, nine women, and seven boys. With these supplies they left Otaheite on the 19th of June, and arrived a second time at Tuboi on the 26th. They warped the ship up the harbor, landed the livestock, and set about building a fort of fifty yards square. While this work was carrying on, quarrels and disagreements were daily happening among them, and continual disputes and skirmishes were taking place with the natives, generally brought on by the violent conduct of the invaders and by depredations committed on their property. Retaliations were attempted by the natives without success, numbers of whom being pursued with firearms were put to death. Still, the situation of the mutineers became so disagreeable and unsafe, the work went on so slowly and reluctantly, that the building of the fort was agreed to be discontinued. Christian, in fact, had very soon perceived that his authority was on the wane, and that no peaceful establishment was likely to be accomplished at Tuboi. He therefore held a consultation as to what would be the most advisable step to take. After much angry discussion, it was at length determined that Tuboi should be abandoned that the ship should once more be taken to Otaheite, and that those who might choose to go on shore there might do so, and those who preferred to remain in the ship might proceed in her to whatever place they should agree upon among themselves. In consequence of this determination, they sailed from Tuboi on the 15th, and arrived at Marayai Bay on the 20th of September, 1789. Here, sixteen of the mutineers were put on shore, at their own request, fourteen of whom were received on board the Pandora, and two of them, as before mentioned, were murdered on the island. The remaining nine agreed to continue in the bounty. The small arms, powder, canvas, and the small stores belonging to the ship were equally divided among the whole crew. The bounty sailed finally from Otaheite on the night of the 21st of September, and was last seen the following morning to the northwest of Point Venus. They took with them seven Otaheitan men and twelve women. It was not even conjectured whither they meant to go, but Christian had frequently been heard to say that his object was to discover some unknown or uninhabited island in which there was no harbor for shipping, that he would run the bounty on shore and make use of her materials to form a settlement, but this was the only account, vague as it was, that could be procured to direct Captain Edwards in his intended search. It appears that when the schooner, of which we have spoken, had been finished, Six of the fourteen mutineers that were left on Otaheite embarked in her, with the intention of proceeding to the East Indies, and actually put to sea. But meeting with bad weather, and suspecting the nautical abilities of Morrison, whom they had elected as commanding officer to conduct her in safety, they resolved on returning to Otaheite. Morrison, it seems, first undertook the construction of this schooner, being himself a tolerable mechanic, in which he was assisted by the two carpenters, the cooper, and some others. To this little band of architects, we are told, Morrison acted both as director and chaplain, distinguishing the Sabbath day by reading to them the church liturgy and hoisting the British colors on a flagstaff erected near the scene of their operations. Conscious of his innocence, his object is stated to have been that of reaching Batavia in time to secure a passage home in the next fleet bound to Holland, but that their return was occasioned not by any distrust of Morrison's talents, but by a refusal on the part of the natives to give them a sufficient quantity of matting and other necessaries for so long a voyage, being, in fact, desirous of retaining them on the island. Stuart and young Haywood took no part in this transaction, having made up their minds to remain at Otaheite, and there to await the arrival of a king's ship, 
it being morally certain that ere long one would be sent out thither to search for them, whatever might have been the fate of Bly and his companions, and that this was really their intention is evident by the alacrity they displayed on getting on board the Pandora the moment of her arrival. On the 8th of May this frigate left Otaheite, accompanied by the little schooner which the mutineers had built, and the history of which is somewhat remarkable. In point of size she was not a great deal larger than Lieutenant Bly's launch, her dimensions being thirty feet length of keel, thirty-five length on deck, nine feet and a half extreme breadth, five feet depth of the hold. She parted from the Pandora near the Palmerston Islands when searching for the bounty, and was not heard of till the arrival of the Pandora's crew at Samarong in Java, where they found her lying at anchor, the crew having suffered so dreadfully from famine and the want of water that one of the young gentlemen belonging to her became delirious. She was a remarkably swift sailor, and being afterwards employed in the sea otter trade, is stated to have made one of the quickest passages ever known from China to the Sandwich Islands. This memorable little vessel was purchased at Canton by the late Captain Broughton to assist him in his surveying the coast of Tartary, and became the means of preserving the crew of His Majesty's ship Providence, amounting to 112 men, when wrecked to the eastward of Formosa in the year 1797. The Pandora called at numerous islands without success, but on Lieutenant Corner having landed on one of the Palmerston's group, he found a yard and some spars with the broad arrow upon them, and marked Bounty. This induced the captain to cause a very minute search to be made in all these islands, in the course of which the Pandora, being driven out to sea by blowing weather, and very thick and hazy, lost sight of the little tender and a jolly boat, the latter of which was never more heard of. This gives occasion to a little splenetic effusion from a writer in a periodic journal, End note 17, which was hardly called for. When this boat, says the writer, with a midshipman and several men, for, had been inhumanely ordered from alongside, it was known that there was nothing in her but one piece of salt beef compassionately thrown in by a seaman, and horrid as must have been their fate, the flippant surgeon, after detailing the disgraceful fact, adds that this is the way the world was peopled, or words to that effect, for we quote only from memory. The following is quoted from the book. It may be difficult to surmise, says the surgeon, what has been the fate of those unfortunate men. They had a piece of salt beef thrown into the boat on them leaving the ship, and it rained a good deal that night and the following day, which might satiate their thirst. It is by these accidents the divine ruler of the universe has peopled the southern hemisphere. This is no more than asserting an acknowledged fact that can hardly admit of a dispute, and there appears nothing in the paragraph which at all affects the character of Captain Edwards, against whom it is leveled. After a fruitless search of three months, the Pandora arrived on the 29th of August, on the coast of New Holland, and close to that extraordinary reef of coral rocks called the Barrier Reef, which runs along the greater part of the eastern coast, but at a considerable distance from it. The boat had been sent out to look for an opening, which was soon discovered, but in the course of the night the ship had drifted past it. On getting soundings, said Captain Edwards in his narrative laid before the court-martial, the topsails were filled, but before the tacks were hauled on board and the other sails made and trimmed, the ship struck upon a reef. We had a quarter less two fathoms on the larboard side and three fathoms on the starboard side. The sails were braced about different ways to endeavour to get her off, but to no purpose. They were then clued up and afterwards furled. The top-gallant yards got down and the top-gallant mast struck. Boats were hoisted out with a view to carry out an anchor but before that could be effected the ship struck so violently on the reef that the carpenter reported she made eighteen inches of water in five minutes and in five minutes after this that there were four feet of water in the hold finding the leak increasing so fast that it was thought necessary to turn the hands to the pumps and to bail at the different hatchways but she still continued to gain upon us so fast that in little more than an hour and a half after she struck there were eight feet and a half of water in the hold about ten we perceived that the ship had beaten over the reef and was in ten fathoms water we therefore let go the small bower anchor cleared away a cable and let go the best bower anchor in fifteen and a half fathoms water underfoot to steady the ship some of her guns were thrown overboard and the water gained upon us only in a small degree and we flattered ourselves that by the assistance of a thrum topsail which we were preparing to haul under the ship's bottom we might be able to lessen the leak and to free her of water. But these flattering hopes did not continue long, for, 
as she settled in the water, the leak increased again, and in so great a degree that there was reason to apprehend she would sink before daylight. During the night two of the pumps were unfortunately for some time rendered useless. One of them, however, was repaired, and we continued bailing and pumping the remainder of the night, and every effort that was thought of was made to keep afloat and preserve the ship. Daylight fortunately appeared, and gave us the opportunity of seeing our situation and the surrounding danger, and it was evident the ship had been carried to the northward by a tide or current. The officers, whom I had consulted on the subject of our situation, gave it as their opinion that nothing more could be done for the preservation of the ship. It then became necessary to endeavour to provide and to find means for the preservation of the people. Our four boats, which consisted of one launch, one eight-oared pinnace, and two six-oared yawls, with careful hands in them, were kept astern of the ship. A small quantity of bread, water, and other necessary articles were put into them. Two canoes, which we had on board, were lashed together and put into the water. Rafts were made, and all floating things upon deck were unlashed. About half-past six in the morning of the twenty-ninth, the hold was full, and the water was between decks, and it also washed in at the upper deck ports, and there were strong indications that the ship was on the very point of sinking, and we began to leap overboard and take to the boats, and before everybody could get out of her, she actually sunk. The boats continued astern of the ship in the direction of the drift of the tide from her, and took up the people that had hold of rafts and other floating things that had been cast loose, for the purpose of supporting them in the water. The double canoe, that was able to support a considerable number of men, broke adrift with only one man and was bulged upon a reef, and afforded us no assistance when she was so much wanted on this trying and melancholy occasion. Two of the boats were laden with men and sent to a small sandy island, or quay, about four miles from the wreck, and I remained near the ship for some time with the other two boats, and picked up all the people that could be seen, and then followed the two first boats to the quay and having landed the men and cleared the boats, they were immediately dispatched again to look about the wreck and the adjoining reef for any that might be missing, but they returned without having found a single person. On mustering the people that were saved, it appeared that eighty-nine of the ship's company and ten of the mutineers that had been prisoners on board answered to their names, but thirty-one of the ship's company and four mutineers were lost with the ship. It is remarkable enough that so little notice is taken of the mutineers in this narrative of the captain, and as the following statement is supposed to come from the late Lieutenant Corner, who was second lieutenant of the Pandora, it is entitled to be considered as authentic, and if so, Captain Edwards must have deserved the character ascribed to him of being altogether destitute of the common feelings of humanity. Three of the bounty's people, Coleman, Norman, and Mackintosh, were now led out of irons and set to work at the pumps. The others afforded their assistance and begged to be allowed a chance of saving their lives. Instead of which, two additional sentinels were placed over them, with orders to shoot any who should attempt to get rid of their fetters. Seeing no prospect of escape, they betook themselves to prayer and prepared to meet their fate, every one expecting that the ship would soon go to pieces, her rudder and part of the stern post being already beat away. When the ship was actually sinking, and every effort making for the preservation of the crew, it is asserted that no notice was taken of the prisoners, as is falsely stated by the author of Pandora's Voyage, although Captain Edwards was entreated by Mr. Haywood to have mercy upon them, when he passed over their prison, to make his own escape, the ship then lying on her broadside, with the larboard bow completely under water. Fortunately, the master at arms, either by accident or design, when slipping from the roof of Pandora's box into the sea, let the keys of the irons fall through the scuttle or entrance, which he had just before opened, and thus enabled them to commence their own liberation in which they were generously assisted, at the imminent risk of his own life, by William Moulter, a boatswain's mate, who clung to the combings and pulled the long bars through the shackles, saying he would set them free or go to the bottom with them. Scarcely was this effected when the ship went down, leaving nothing visible but the topmast cross trees. The master at arms and all the sentinels sunk to rise no more. The cries of them and the other drowning men were awful in the extreme, and more than half an hour had elapsed before the survivors could be taken up by the boats. Among the former were Mr. Stewart, John Sumner, Richard Skinner, and Henry Hilbrandt, the whole of whom perished with their hands still in manacles. On this melancholy occasion Mr. Haywood was the last person but three, 
who escaped from the prison, into which the water had already found its way through the bulkhead scuttles. Jumping overboard, he seized a plank and was swimming towards a small sandy quay, about three miles distant, when a boat picked him up, and conveyed him thither in a state of nudity. It is worthy of remark that James Morrison endeavoured to follow his young companion's example, and, although handcuffed, managed to keep afloat until a boat came to his assistance. This account would appear almost incredible. It is true men are sometimes found to act the part of inhuman monsters, but then they are generally actuated by some motive or extraordinary excitement. Here, however, there was neither. But on the contrary, the condition of the poor prisoners appealed more forcibly to the mercy and humanity of their jailer. The surgeon of the ship states, in his account of her loss, that as soon as the spars, booms, hencoops, and other buoyant articles were cut loose, the prisoners were ordered to be let out of the irons. One would imagine, indeed, that the officers on this dreadful emergency would not be witness to such inhumanity, without remonstrating effectually against keeping these unfortunate men confined a moment beyond the period when it became evident that the ship must sink. It will be seen, however, presently, from Mr. Haywood's own statement, that they were so kept, and that the brutal and unfeeling conduct which has been imputed to Captain Edwards is but too true. End of chapter 5, part 1. Recording by Haley Flagg of Texas.